Yep. You got to turn your microphone off. Your speakers. Okay, you ready to start then, eh? Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, my name's Andrew Reiki, and uh, I'd just like to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, and uh, Lillian's happily married, which is kind of nice to know, seeing she's actually my wife, for over 30 years with two adult sons. Uh, originally a primary teacher, uh, she became a parenting strategist because of her journey with her younger son, who was diagnosed over 24 years ago, well, that long ago, uh, with ADHD, ODD, and childhood depression at the age of four. Lillian and I uh, decided to take a more holistic approach to helping our son after medication was recommended on several occasions for both her younger son and herself, actually. Um, it is this very journey and the roller coaster ride that we've experienced over the years that um, makes, I guess, makes her reputable, repu gee, I'll get that out, reputable uh, to so many families struggling with their children. Uh, uh, Lillian has a huge passion for empowering parents to enjoy happy and healthy children and relationships. Uh, Lillian is also an advanced trainer in the Nurtured Heart Approach, which is a beautiful heart-centered way of communicating and relationshiping, and she believes every family should understand and learn this approach. She loves to share her passion for NHA with as many families as possible. And look, I'm going to actually leave it for Lillian to explain more about some of the different things that she's done in the last 25 years in relation to this. But at this point, I'd love to hand over to her to take things on further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. It is awesome to be here. And how lovely is it to have my amazing husband introduce me this evening? Um, so great to be here. Thank you so much for those of you who are joining us on the Facebook page, um, or if you are catching the replay. So let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you confirm that we can see that screen, please, Andrew? Okay. Awesome. So who wants to ditch the parenting stress, overwhelm and chaos and replace it with some more ease, joy and calm. Well, that's what we're here to help you um, do this evening. Hey, Krishla, lovely to see you here. Thank you for joining us. So I want to really congratulate you all for joining us here tonight. And I know it's the middle of December and Christmas is looming. However, you know, I think this information is really, really important, particularly leading into the festive and holiday season. So I really, really want to acknowledge you for taking the time out to be here live tonight or watching the replay with us. And I would love to encourage you to play all in. If you can, I would love you to interact, to answer questions and to share some thoughts with us this evening so that this is just not me talking, but a little bit of interaction happening as well. Hey, Laura. So why are you here? Now, I have my magical parenting wand with me, my beautiful rose crystal and garnet parenting special magic wand. And if I could wave this magical wand for you, what would you most love us to magically do or solve for you? Or what would you really love to get out of this masterclass? If you're in, if you're in the position to be able to pop some answers down, that would be awesome. What would you like me to magically solve or help you with in regards to your family and parenting? So for those of you who are on here live, I really do encourage you to stick around because firstly, every single person who is on live who sticks around to the end will be given a um, $160 free gift from me and one lucky family will also win a free scholarship for our upcoming 2022 parenting um, course starting hopefully in January of 2022. So definitely worth sticking around for that. 
Okay, so Andrew introduced me, but a little bit more about, you know, who am I and why should you listen to me? Well, I am a mum, so I'm definitely a parent. I have two adult sons. Uh, my youngest son is our, our challenging son that we're going to be talking a lot about tonight. I'm also a primary school teacher, so I have a degree in, in the Bachelor of Arts. I also have a degree in what I call TTP, which is Tried and Tested Parenting, which is my pseudo degree, but probably my most favorite one. Um, I um, have been a parenting strategist and coach for well over 20 years. I'm the author of six books written between 2003 and 2013. I'm a Nurtured Heart Approach Advanced Trainer, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. I am a seminar and workshop facilitator um, to many, many thousands over the years. Uh, I've been a parenting uh, specialist on weekly TV, featured uh, on weekly radio, uh, featured on TV and many magazines and newspapers, and more recently, a sought after podcast guest in all different countries around the world. It's been amazing. So I feel it's really important to share our story because you might be thinking, well, you know, what gives me the credentials to talk parenting and to share, you know, what I'm sharing? Well, basically, Andrew, who you just heard from, and I have lived this, our whole family have lived this. So I now have two amazing adult sons. Our second son was born seven and a half years after his big brother. Uh, his big brother, Nathan, who you'll meet a little bit later, was a very quiet and passive child um, and very compliant, cooperative sort of kid. But when his little brother came along, it was a really, really stressful birth. I can, I can still remember, even though that was 28 plus years ago. We had challenges from birth. He was irritable, uh, screaming, uh, unsettled, not sleeping. He was an unhappy baby and an unhappy big brother. And so we had an unhappy baby and we had an unhappy big brother. And we had very, very stressed parents. So um, when it came to childcare, because I went back to work in, in my husband's business, actually, uh, and, he, and there were five childcare centres in our town at that time, in our town of Shepparton, and uh, he went to the whole five centres. He was diagnosed by a paediatrician, psychologist, psychiatrist with childhood depression, ODD, which is Oppositional Defiant Disorder, and ADHD, which most of you know as Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And he was diagnosed with all of those before he started school. And medication was recommended by all of those people. Now, in his um, fourth of five childcare centres, they actually kept a communication book. And it was a full communication book. And every day we got feedback from the carers with what he was doing on a daily basis. And this is just an example. This was one morning of his, and you can read that there, but he got into all sorts of stuff, right? He was throwing stuff, slamming doors, you know, knocking containers over, messing up tables, hurting kids, breaking their glasses, you know, putting a hole in the wall. He was into all sorts of mischief. And unfortunately, the carers, well, they were great carers. They were really doing their very best, but unfortunately they were doing what we call upside down caring where they were really focusing their attention on the things that he was doing wrong and probably much less attention on what he might have been doing right or even the baby steps he might have been taking towards doing something right. Um, and many of us parent upside down unknowingly, um, in, uh, unintentionally, but we just do, even with the, the most love and care and you know, dedication as parents in our heart. So his first day of school, he looked happy enough. He was a cute little boy, took a great photo, but it was a very, very stressful year indeed. Uh, he spent more time in time out than he did learning. Uh, we did move him the following year to a Steiner school and he did have happier days in the Steiner school. They had a whole different approach to education and he really felt at home there. Um, it wasn't perfect, but he did a lot better in that school. Uh, unfortunately, that school closed down in uh, year five, and then he had to go to another local primary school before we then moved to Queensland, and then yet another primary school that didn't go so well. So we decided to move him yet again for the year seven. So he literally went to four different schools within four years, and it was really, really stressful for him and for our family. 
Year seven, wow, I, <laughs> I could talk about this for ages, but year seven was a really challenging year. Well, it was really the start of where the challenges really escalated. So we thought after having him in three different primary schools over the prior, actually the prior two years, that um, a private school, a strict kind of, you know, ang Anglican, you know, uh, school might be the way to go. But it backfired big time. So we had to pay a lot of money to find out that this also was not helpful. He ended up having the school record. And some people might say, well, that's awesome, you know, that he had a school record, um, but it wasn't a positive thing. He actually had a school record for the most number of red cards. And they had a disciplinary system in the school that went from yellow to green yellow, green, blue to red. And he had the most number of red cards and he was only in year seven. Uh, so he was actually asked to leave that school at the end of first term of year eight. Then he went to another regular secondary schools and things went from bad to worse. Uh, really, really challenging. And this is where the revolt happened. And if you look at the word revolt, it's actually the word love back to front. You can see there in the red, L-O-V-E. And what that means to me is that kids who are revolting are really looking for love. They're looking for acceptance. They're looking for love. They're looking for the right sort of connection. Um, we didn't know what we didn't know then. Andrew and I were good parents. We had all the love in our heart. We wanted the best for both of our sons, but we didn't know what we were doing. And we were so parenting upside down. It was the most stressful time in our parenting journey, for sure. So between age 13 and 15, the challenges that we had between age three and five are 10 x like seriously 10 x he went to two secondary schools in two years. Um, Non-attendance was suspended for more days than he attended. He had a terrible reputation with the teachers. We got so many calls from the school. We knew the number off by heart. I'm surprised I still don't remember it. He was labelled a troublemaker at school, right? He was mixing in the wrong crowds. He was getting into inappropriate behaviours and in trouble with the police. And he ended up leaving school at age 15 with a very poor school attendance and grades. And then the universe stepped in and we connected with our angel, Frank. So we had just connected with Frank, who was our parenting mentor. So just like I'm a parenting mentor to lots of people, Frank was actually our parenting mentor. We had just started coaching with him when an incident happened. And I have so much regret I'll do my best not to cry when I share this story. I have so much regret around my upside down parenting, particularly for this situation. So not long after we'd started mentoring and coaching with Frank, we got another phone call, yet another phone call from the school to say that our son had been in trouble yet again and that it was really serious this time and that we would need to come up to the school. Uh, he's going to be suspended and, you know, it was serious. And, but they also called me to say that he had actually run off and he wasn't at school. So they wanted to alert me to that. So all I could do was wait for him to get home. He did have a mobile phone, which he wasn't answering. Um, wait for him to get home. And he did actually turn up at home. But what did I do? I went straight into upside down parenting instead of saying or being compassionate or thoughtful, how was your day, being ready to listen if he said it was terrible, this happened and that happened. Straight away, I went into upside down, yelling, nagging and threats. What did you do? Why did you do it? How did you do it? How can you do this to us? You're grounded until you're 25. You know, like I just went straight into that upside down parenting with so much regret now that I know what I know, but I didn't know what I didn't know back then. And as a consequence of that, he ran off, um, used some very choice language um, and basically told me what I could do with my opinions and off he went. And I figured when he cooled down, he would just come home, he'd get hungry and come home for dinner. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And to cut quite a traumatic story short for the, for the um, purpose of this evening, my husband got home later that night after work. He went out in the car looking for our son, um, and, you know, going to some houses of some kids that he thought he, that might have known where he was. 
he bumped into one kid who basically said, I saw him earlier, but he really wasn't in a very good place or a very good state. Uh, Andrew kept driving around and eventually found him on a street corner in pretty much a drunken stupor in the gutter. You know, like he basically didn't know his name or where he was. He was so out of it. Um, and um, he, bought, he bought him home. In the meantime, um, and he was so out of it, he literally just was not cohesive in any sort of shape or form. So we had a conversation with our, um, with our angel, Frank, and he taught us or shared with us some different strategies that than we would have normally done, right? So we actually, it took him almost two days to sober up. That's how bad things were. And when he came out of that, instead of the typical yelling, nagging and threats and the upside down parenting, we took Frank's advice and we took a whole different approach. We became his biggest supporters and fans, showed him unconditional love and just wanted to let him know that we were there for him. We didn't ask him what happened, why it happened, what did he take, because none of that mattered. It had already happened. We just wanted to be there to be of support to him. And that really became the start of our healing journey in so many ways, because he was like, what the, you know, what is going on with my parents? I'm, I'm you know, so expecting all of the lectures and all of the, you know, the, the grounding and everything to happen. So you can see from the two pictures here, you know, just a short while prior, he was very defiant. He was very oppositional. He was really revolting against everything, school, home, you know, any sort of control, any sort of discipline. And after that revolt, at, as, a, as a result of this journey, as a result of what happened um, in, in more the way that we responded, and we were just there, we were his biggest supporters and, and fans, and we allowed him to start making some choices about not going back to school, um, and, you know, supporting him to get an apprenticeship, etc. It really, really turned things around because he was like, wow, mum and dad are really here for me. They really are my biggest supporters and fans. And they're speaking to me in different ways than they used to, right? And giving energy in a different way. It was really amazing. Thank you for all the love coming in. Much, much appreciated. And he had a very fractured relationship with his big brother because big brother was quiet and cooperative and compliant. And then all of a sudden, little brother comes along and totally, you know, changes our family dynamic. Um, and it was very stressful for Nathan because he, he, he wanted a quiet and, you know, and a home where he could, you know, just enjoy his family, whereas it was really difficult with his younger brother. But as a result of, of um, the healing, their um, relationship definitely um, mended. Um, and it's a beautiful story, but he, uh, Caleb actually ended up in business with my husband, Andrew, uh, his dad. Uh, they started in business in 2012. So um, coming up very, very shortly will be their 10th year. So that's pretty amazing that they have been working together 10 years. So I'd actually love to invite Andrew now to share his experience, you know, with that during that challenging time and what we did and, and the work that I'm doing now and how much that's really impacting other families as well. But just before I bring Andrew on, can I please just remind everybody who is on live to make sure they comment in the Facebook page so we know you're there. Um, if you don't comment, we won't know you're there and we won't be able to put you in the draw at the end of the evening. So please do comment so we know you're there. So um, I'm going to mute and hand over to Andrew, who's just going to share with you for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hey. Okay. Uh, where do I start? Uh, this and the teachings that we learned from Frank and what Lillian is actually sharing um, with all of her people in her courses, all of the families that are seeking a better way of living. Um, the information has been just so dramatically life-changing for us. It's, it changes everything. Um, Caleb and I have gone from what was a a very confrontational relationship um, to a, a, a level that 
I don't know. I don't know whether many people could even envisage um, ha- being able to do what we do. We are uh, eight, eight to twelve hours a day, uh, five days a week, within the six meters of each other. Um, we work together on an ongoing basis, and on the twenty eighth of January next year will be the um, our tenth anniversary. And in that 10 years, we've never raised a voice at each other. Um, we've never had an angry word in any way, um, never argued. We disagree constantly because we're both fairly strong-minded and pig-headed, but we love and respect each other so much that we could never raise our voices to each other. And, and I don't know how much sense that makes, but it's... This has been completely life-changing. We have unprogrammed an entire, um, my entire upbringing so, uh, to the point where um, a lot of the mannerisms and things that I had um, and didn't even realise I was doing at the time uh, that I have control of, uh, uh, there's through the teachings from Frank and now from the Nurtured Heart approach, it changes everything. And the harmony that we have and the, our ability to work together constantly under what's sometimes quite stressful conditions without ever getting um, to the point where we're actually angry with each other has been truly amazing. And I wish everyone could enjoy this. Hopefully that's... I hope that's helped somebody. But dads, dads, dads have to understand this isn't just mum's job here. Um, it, it's time to step up. And, and for me, stepping up as a man meant becoming a real father. And uh, it's the most important job we'll ever have. And, and it's one that needs to be taken more seriously than our employment, way more seriously. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm just going to put my speakers back on now. Thank you so much for sharing, Andrew. And I've got to say that, you know, if there are dads out there listening and or if mums feel like it's their responsibility to, you know, improve their parenting relationships, I've got to say that Andrew took this on with so much love in his heart, you know, back 12 or 13 years ago. He embraced this. He embraced the new language and the new way that we um, that we communicated with our son. And I really feel like a lot of the breakthroughs were because of the effort that Andrew made. Um, and he and, and Caleb are best friends, like they really are. Um, and they're so alike. They're so alike. So thanks, Andrew, for sharing. Um, so that this is my beautiful family here. So that's Andrew and I. That's my youngest son and his beautiful partner, Amy. And, of course, Nathan, you'll meet a little bit later on. Thank you so much for all the comments coming in. I really appreciate it. I'll have a chance a bit later to read through them all, but I can see there's lots of comments going there. Maybe Andrew and or Nathan might be able to check on the on the um, comments and uh, respond. That would be awesome. Thank you. So how did I find out about Nurtured Heart? Well, what is Nurtured Heart Approach? So for those of you who haven't heard me speak about this before, You'll, you'll recall I just spoke about our parenting coach, our angel Frank. So Frank um, was actually the reason um, behind my third and favourite book, The Revolting Child of Blessing in Disguise. And there's a story to that as well, which I'll have to tell another day. But Frank actually taught us how important language is and how important the words we use are and where we place our energy And the stuff that he taught us literally changed our relationship to the point where the child or the the teen that we had 10 months later had just been replaced with a completely different person. Like he literally was a different person. And it was because we implemented the things that Frank taught us. So a few years um, post that, I actually... um, found out about the Nurtured Heart Approach. As a matter of fact, I met a a, um, a psychologist who actually asked me what I did. And when I shared what I did, she said, oh, I've just heard about that. Is that the Nurtured Heart Approach? And I'm like, well, I've got no idea what the Nurtured Heart Approach is. And, um, And 
consequently, I wrote it down and went and Googled it. And I spent like half a day just checking it out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. And this is so much in alignment with what we've learned with Frank. So um, cut long story short, I connected in, um, they had just introduced it into Australia. I went to every single training I could take. Then the um, founder of uh, Nurtured Heart Approach, Howard Glasser, and it's going to be 30 years, 30 years in existence next year. Um, but only um, since 2014, 13, 14 has it been in Australia. So I did the very first uh, Nurtured Heart Approach Certified Intensive Training in 2014. And then in June of this year, 2021, I qualified to be an advanced trainer. So Howie has actually sent us a special little hello all the way from Tucson, Arizona. So let me play that for you. Hi, Lillian. Hi, my friends in Australia. Um, I am so happy you found your way to the Nurtured Heart Approach. Uh, you're in the best of hands and uh, I hope you enjoy the ride. It, it will be revealing and fun and empowering. Be well. Thank you, Howie. And the interesting thing is that even though we never met our parenting coach, Frank, and we never, we didn't do Zoom calls back then, it was all on the phone. So we never actually saw his face, except on that first old video that we watched of him. But they, he actually reminds, Howard and Frank actually remind me, uh, like they're similar, they remind me of each other, which is quite interesting. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the Nurtured Heart Approach. Um, because this is something that I'm so very, very passionate about sharing now. As a matter of fact, I've really put aside most of my other parenting work to concentrate on the Nurtured Heart Approach because it is so profound and it is helping so many families. And we're going to hear from Laura very shortly. She's on live and um, I've got a couple of other video um, um, shares for you to listen to as well. But the Nurtured Heart Approach was originally uh, devised for helping to transform the very intense children, the kids with the ADHD and ODD, kids like our youngest son. But what we've come to learn over the years is it really helps all children and, dare I say, all relationships to flourish. So it's based on uh, three stands. So its core methodology is based on three stands. So stand one is absolutely no. Stand two is absolutely yes. And stand three is absolutely clear. And when you think about the word stand, it's very purposeful. Like when you take a stand for something, it means you get clear, you get resolute, you get precise. You can't take a stand when you're wishy-washy. So if you think about something you're passionate about and that you take a stand on, it's something you stand strong in, right? So that with these stands, they allow us to really have this inner strength and knowing about you know, our parenting and how we're relationshiping. Thank you for all the love coming in. It's beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So stand one, um, this is a growing edge for everyone who practices this approach. So we all energize negativity from time to time. Uh, some of us <laughs> do it a bit more naturally um, and more often than others, um, I guess. And you know, there is no mandate to never drop the ball or else on this stand. So if you do find yourself energizing the negative, you just simply switch it or reset yourself back to what's going right. So the base basis of stand one is actually, I refuse to energize negativity. Now, if you think about our parenting relationships, a lot of that is or has been based on energizing the negative, the things that are going wrong with our kids and, and you know, what they're doing. It also represents not rewarding negativity um, and negativity can be based around disruptions or outbursts that distract children from their greatness um, with elevated energy connection or relationships. So we don't want to give our connection, our energy and our relationship to the kids when they're behaving or doing something negatively. It also means that I will be intentional to watch where my energy is flowing. So some of you may have heard this saying, where attention goes, energy flows and results show. So stand two 
is absolutely yes. So now that we've established where we don't want energy to flow in rich forms, we need to be able to key into where we do want the energy to flow at even more heightened levels than we have before. So absolutely yes to showing up in big ways when things are going right. I relentlessly create and energise positivity and success. I energise and nurture firsthand experiences of success. I will work immediately to identify, describe and express appreciation for steps large and small a child takes in manifesting his or her positive choices and intrinsic greatness. And I will actively initiate opportunities for children to be successful. So for those people who have just been doing my course, we spent quite a lot of time in stand two going through these four recognitions. And when you, you come and do my course, I actually um, take, take two weeks to cover these recognitions because there's so much involved. So there's the active recognition, which is what we call the codec moments where we watch, describe and document. There's the experiential recognition we call Polaroid moments is um, where we recognize a behavior and the appreciation of the quality that that shows in the person. Um, the third one is proactive recognitions. We call them canon moments. And that's actually appreciation of rules not broken. That was an interesting concept to get my head around initially. And then the fourth one, creative recognition, or we call those Photoshop moments, is noticing and appreciating what's happening in the right direction. So we go into a lot of detail about how to do these recognitions in the course. And I actually share with the participants that doing the Nurture Heart Approach course is like learning a new language. We're using words in English, but we're using them in a whole different way. And I'm sure that um, you'll probably hear something from, from Laura or from the other people on the call tonight. So stand three is absolutely clear. I set and enforce um, clear limits and clear consequences in an unenergized way. I will consistently enforce rules and provide immediate consequences each time a rule is broken by way of a simple form of a consequence called a reset. So the resets are amazing. Um, I will recognize a child in the moment they have reset and create that next moment as an opportunity for success. So when you look at the three stands, it's a little bit like a dance or like juggling three balls. You, don't necessarily use the three stands in isolation, but you become fluent in using the three stands together or where you need them to. And, a, and an important part of stand three is the reset where we um, teach you to reset yourself back if you are in a heightened or a negative place. And we teach you to teach your children how to reset if they've broken a rule or if they're moving towards something negative or if they're not feeling in a positive place themselves. It's a beautiful tool to have. So um, I love the reset. And Laura, um, I'm going to invite you on now. So if you could just get yourself ready. Uh, Laura has been participating in this course. So we've just done week eight of week no, of nine weeks. Laura has a beautiful family. She has um, a very good looking husband, actually, Laura, and, uh, and three um, young boys. I think um, maybe they're a little bit older now because I think the oldest one's about 15, if I've got that right. So Laura, I would love for you to just come on and share what you've experienced with the Nurture Heart Approach, how it is benefiting your family or whatever you'd love to share from your heart. We would love to hear from you. And I'm going to stop sharing so we can actually see you fully. Oh, you know what I didn't do, Laura? I did not send you the Zoom link. Okay, what I'm going to do, uh, Nathan, if you are um, on, if you are listening in, Nathan or Andrew, could you please send Laura the Zoom link, Laura Hurrell? I'm so sorry. And I'll continue on, Laura, and ask you to come back when you jump on Zoom. Can Nathan or Andrew confirm with me that they've, um, that they have, um, can do that for me? Put it in the group. Uh, yeah, so Nathan's going to put the Zoom link on the on on this um, Facebook page. Laura, if you could just jump onto that Facebook page. Yes. Um, my apologies, I actually didn't think too well in advance, but I'll come back to you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Nathan's going to put the Zoom link on the forum on on this um, 
Enter. Okay. So Laura, I will just wait for you to jump on, on Zoom and then I'll introduce you. So Toys are Us. So have you ever thought that we are actually our children's most compelling toy? You might not have thought about that, right? We have a zillion different ways to be interesting. And when you think about it, what do kids do when they get a new toy? They want to enthusiastically explore it. They want to know what it has to offer. And they hopefully find some compelling features. And um, then they might also find some features that are boring. And once they designate a feature as truly boring, they write it off and they won't go back um, they won't go back on purpose. So let me share the screen again until Laura jumps on. Um, so how are we like toys? Um, as adults, um, if you look at all the ways we move and all the ways we are physically active and look at all the motions we have, not just happy, glad and sad, but all of our own unique versions of each, um, we are by far the greatest features, I have the greatest features of any other toy. So as a mum or a dad or even a grandparent or perhaps even, a, um, perhaps even an educator, you will actually um, be your child's favourite toy and they are looking for every opportunity to see how to get this toy to engage, how to get this toy to actually come to life. And when you think about it, we come more to life when um, we are energizing what the kids are doing wrong. So our children have actually experienced all of those features of ours and it sets the bar for what is energetically possible. So when things are going right with our kids, we might say good job or thank you. Um, and that might be it, but that becomes a bit boring, like a bit like a boring uh, feature on the toy in comparison to all the blinking lights and the bells and whistles that negativity and non-compliance brings out in us. So if you actually think about it, you know, we're quite boring when things are going right, aren't we? We, <laughs> our responses to the positive pale in relation to those for the negative. And we inadvertently show children they get more from negativity. So, um, yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? So um, as, as their favourite toys, we actually are, are teaching them in some respect that they get more connection, more relationship, more energy from us when they are doing the wrong thing. And then when they're doing the right thing, we're pretty boring, right? And... I have another story that I actually really want to share with you, and it comes from the Revolting Child book. And hopefully Laura will be on, um, on the Zoom shortly so we can um, bring her on for her testimony. And I'm so sorry, Laura, I didn't even think that um, ahead that you needed to, to actually be on the uh, Zoom link. So, um, yeah, I'll just wait for you to jump on. So in the meantime, I'm actually going to read a story that once again is usually a bit of a tearjerker because when I actually wrote this book, well, when I was getting ready, I, I got a call. Who's ever got a call, a nudge from the universe to, to, um, to say that, um, you know, you need to do something or be somewhere or, or go somewhere. We've got Laura now. Hey, Laura, I'll just get... Okay, have I been muted all of that time? Okay, uh, I'll just get you to hold on for a moment, Laura. I'll just finish this page and then I'll get you to share. Yeah. So, thank you, love. Have I been muted all of that time? Okay. Uh, I'll just get you to hold on for a moment, Laura. I'll just finish this page and then I'll get you to share. Yeah. So, thank you, love. Have I been muted all of that time? I don't know what's going on here. I've got an okay. idea. Okay, <laughs> gotta love technology. Di's joined us on the Zoom as well. Hey, Di, how are you? Join us on the Facebook page, Di, so you can interact. That will be great. So um, this is a story I'm going to share about Nathan. So when, when I was getting ready to write this book, I actually wanted to get permission from my whole family. 
I wanted to get their permission to write this because it was going to be really a tell-all story. So I actually um, asked Andrew, Nathan and Caleb if they would share. And I asked them all to write something. I didn't tell them what I wanted them to write. I just said I would like them to share something about our family's journey. And what Caleb actually wrote was so amazing that I actually made that the forward for the book. So if you haven't read this book yet, I really would advise you to read it. Um, it's pretty amazing what he wrote at age 15. But Nathan, as a young 20, um, so he would have been uh, 22, maybe 23, what he wrote absolutely shocked me because I did not know this. And the reason I'm sharing this is because when we are parenting an intense and challenging child and, the, um, and they're you know, seeking us as their favorite toy to get all of the negative attention and energy and relationship from them, sometimes the good kid in the family or the quieter or the more compliant kid really misses out on relationship as well. So let me just read some of this to you. Um, I remember when I was at the hospital with our neighbours who brought me in just after Caleb was born. We were waiting around the corner and I was feeling really anxious and uncertain about how our life was about to change. Now we had a new baby coming into our family. I also remember Caleb's first birthday party where the centre of attention was on Caleb. I couldn't understand why everyone was fussing over him so much that he was being so disruptive and screaming all of the time. I felt like things were really out of balance. I remember making up his train set that he got for a present to make him happy, but it didn't and he still kept screaming and later he mucked it all up. When he did that, the balance that I thought I'd created, and remember Nathan's just a young, a young teen at this age, um, um, mucked up too. I started wondering if this is what it was going to be like um, having Caleb around. Our family always seemed to be out of balance and I didn't like it. I remember when I was questioned for something that Caleb did that I was never given the chance to really express how I felt and that nobody would really listen. So I began to think that I should just keep to myself and not bother with trying to explain because Caleb took up too much time. So I just bottled it up. Um, I remember when I went to the psychiatrist and she suggested we get a dog. I remember looking at the dogs at a lady's house. I was sat in the middle of them and one dog came up to me and sat next to me. She looked up at me as if to say, I am the one that is here to help you. I was about 10 years old then and we called her Maddie. Maddie became a good friend to me and was the only one I felt I could talk to about what was happening with my younger brother. I felt she was the only one who would listen. Since that time, I still used to think a lot of negative thoughts about myself, which even seemed to affect my friendships at school. It was almost like all the negative thoughts really came true. So even at school, I lost a lot of my friends. I felt like I was attracting only negative things in my life. So things became pretty bad for me, both at home and at school. And this is hard to read, it really is, because, oh boy, um, I can remember feeling so bad one day that I got some electrical cable. Andrew used it when he was wiring houses from the garage and put it around a branch high up in a tree and then tied it in a loop and around my neck. The cable was taut, but I was still leaning against the tree for support. I only had to let go or slip and I would not be here today to share this with you. I'm not sure why I didn't go through with it, but I'm glad I didn't. I never told anyone about that till now. So I didn't know that until Nathan was in his 20s, like, you know, 10 years later. I can remember growing up with Caleb was pretty hard. Sometimes it got so bad that I've either he or I had to go. One day it got so bad that I pinned Caleb down on the floor with my foot. I wasn't sure what I was doing or what was going through my head, but it felt like I wasn't coping. I'm glad Andrew came into the room when he did in time before I did something I regretted. And he goes on um, with a few more stories and then he goes on, you know, to talk about when things have changed and how proud he is of Caleb and where Caleb is going now and that he's turned a big corner. So the reason I share that with you is really to have you understand, you know, how important it is that we give 
you know, positive energy to all of our children, not just to our well-behaved or our challenging ones. So Laura, I've gone back to this slide now. Thank you so much for jumping on. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now so Laura can jump on. So please unmute Laura, pop your camera on and we would love to have you share. Hi, can you hear me? I can, beautiful, yes, thank you. All right, hi, I'm Laura. Um, I have three boys, age 7, 10 and 13, with my 13-year-old who is my intense, challenging child. Um, so he's actually, he's always been defiant for as long as I can remember um, and he's always found it hard to follow rules. He used to get in trouble a lot at school, spend a lot of time in the office or in detention. Um, at home, he used to annoy his brothers, ignore the rules and sometimes got quite aggressive. Um, so obviously we tried lots of things to help him and to help us, but it seemed like nothing really worked to, to help him to change. Like there was little improvements, but nothing, there was always something that we were trying to, to work out or to change or to do something. So me and my husband did other parenting courses and things, um, but yeah, nothing really seemed to work for him. Ignoring his behavior only made him worse. Grounding him never worked. I couldn't put him in timeout because he wouldn't listen to me anyway. Um, taking away his privileges, he didn't seem to care about. I think at one point we'd taken away all his toys in his room and he had nothing left. Um, so we're always just trying lots of different techniques to try and help him. But I've always known like in my gut that we needed to fill his bucket and boost his self-esteem with positivity but sometimes I just didn't know how to do that um, I even thought sometimes that there was nothing positive about him which is obviously not true so I'm gonna cry now <laughs> okay so then I spoke to Lillian um, and the nurtured heart approach has just saved our lives basically <laughs> um, everything has changed Everything about the program just made sense to me. Um, and I realized how much we'd been parenting upside down. So the program is so easy to follow. Um, the three stands make it so simple. Um, I now know how to notice positive things in all my kids, even in situations where in the past I would have thought that there's nothing positive here. And I can see so much positivity and potential in my son. And now I actually enjoy his company. Um, so, yeah, I'm very thankful to Lillian. And having the, the, weekly, the weekly sessions is awesome. Like you learn a new skill each week and you get time to build and practice on that skill. And then... Um, the next week you, you learn something else and it builds on it each week throughout it. Um, there's lots of opportunity to discuss what's been going on in the week, what's been working well for you, any struggles that you've had and um, chatting with the other people in the group. You learn so much from their stories and their experiences as well. So, and another thing I've noticed is that by not giving energy to the negative things, I actually feel less tired. So I'm less cranky and I'm happier. So yeah, lot, lots of positives have come out of this course for me. So I would highly recommend it for, for every parent, but especially for parents of kids, of challenging kids. Oh, Laura, that was so <laughs> beautiful, love. Thank you so much. And I love your vulnerability. And sometimes we do get that little like, I'm going to cry or that little <laughs> of the heart. And Laura's been awesome. She's been sharing on our weekly calls, you know, the things that have been happening and improving in her family. And I'm so happy for you, Laura. Thank you, love. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate you sharing. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's once again, sorry, I said your eldest son was 15, but he's only 15. He's, he's 13, yeah. Um, and one of the ladies said in the chat before year seven seems to be the trouble and mm. Corey's story was similar to Caleb's we sort of survived through primary school and then high school everything just seemed to get on top of us so I met you at the perfect time <laughs> I'm so pleased thank you I love how the universe works and connects people you know in the right space in the right time thank you so much for sharing Laura
Mm -hmm. um, really, really appreciate it. So, um, so when you think about it, and Laura, I'm sure you can relate to this, you know, when are we radiating most energy normally? You know, uh, what if you think about some of the examples of when your buttons were pushed, you know, things that really made you react violently as, as parents listening in tonight or, or educators or, or grandparents, you know, think of an incident perhaps that happened recently or maybe a, a, a group of incidents, you know, did you come more to life when the kids were being cooperative, well-behaved and playing quietly. So did that favourite toy really come to life then? Or was it in a negative situation when the kids weren't listening, they were breaking the rules, being uncooperative, disrespectful or arguing? Is that when you came most to life? So for many of us, it would be in the latter um, um, circumstances when we were heightened by negativity. That's when the toy comes to life. That's when the eyes pop and the arms move and the parts go. That's when our face turns red from sh you know, yelling and shouting and threatening and nagging and all that stuff. That's when we're radiating the most energy. And what the Nurtured Heart Approach teaches us is to turn that round the other way because that's completely upside down. We should be giving most energy to what we want more of or what we want to grow more of. And I love to use this analogy, which is on the next picture here, of the watering can. So if we were to get our watering can and put in some beautiful clean water, fill it with nutrients and fertiliser, things to help grow the plants, would we go out with that beautiful water filled with you know, nutrients and fertilizer and water the weeds? Or would we go out and use it to water the flowers? So it wouldn't make a lot of sense for us to use that to go and water the weeds because we don't want the weeds to grow, do we? <laughs> but we do want our beautiful flowers or our herbs or our veggies or our plants to grow. That's what we want to water. But many of us are inadvertently watering the weeds. We're giving our energy, our attention, our connection, our relationship to growing what we do not want more of. And then we wonder why we keep getting more of that back again, because universally that's just, uh, that's just how it works, right? What we give attention to grows and we attract more of that back. So by switching that around, it makes a huge difference, as you just heard so beautifully from, from Laura. So some children actually live their life in this upside down energy. And it's not because parents aren't loving and caring and committed and, and you know, want the best for their kids. They just don't know what they don't know. And it becomes like a pattern. And um, if the toy is more animated and compelling and alive and energized when things are going wrong, then for the child, that then gets transmitted and translated energetically to feeling more loved, more valued and more celebrated in relation to problems. So mum and dad can really say they love good behaviour all day long, but the truth of the energy that the child deeply feels is being loved and connected more when things go wrong because that's when mum and dad really show up. That's, you know, they're barely there when I do the right things. You know, I might get that thank you or good job, which we call junk food, but they barely show up when I'm doing the right thing. So this is, you know, what we refer to as the upside down energy. And we talk a lot more about that in the nine week course. So Sharon um, would have loved to have been um, with us this evening, but she's taking a nice little break um, away for a few days after having a big year of teaching. So mum, uh, Sharon is a mum. Um, her children are grown up, but she's also a stepmother of a teenager. Uh, she's a teacher. She's a life coach. She's an emoji coach. She has this amazing program, which you should go and check out. And she's a family support whisperer. Uh, she's an amazing woman and she supports families um, um, in so many beautiful ways. So I'm going to just share a little video that she um, sent me because she couldn't be here this evening. Hi, everyone. This is Sharon Chamello. Um, I am sorry I can't join you on Lillian's Masterclass. I wish I could, but I am going to be away um, because I'm on school holidays. So I am a mum and a teacher and a coach for families. And I've just been doing Lillian's nine-week uh, Nurtured Heart Approach course, 
which has been just amazing um, learning, uh, especially for my teaching. It's really helped me with my teaching. But as a step parent, it's really helped me too to understand about focusing on the positives and um, and not the negatives. Um, I'm still learning how to do that, but um, the learning from Lillian is definitely there. Um, it's a really great course. It's um, it's very structured, um, and certainly uh, naturopath Nate. Uh, has been amazing as well with all the information uh, that he supports Lillian with. So I really appreciate um, meeting Lillian and coming into the course and um, sending lots of my people in my family's group to Lillian's work and Nathan's work. And um, yeah, I hope you all have a great masterclass without me. I will watch the replay and um, yeah, enjoy the evening. Thanks, Lillian. Bye. Thank you so much, Sharon. Sharon has been the hugest advocate of my work. She shares it with everybody because she really sees the results that she's getting as an educator and also as a, as a parent, particularly in her step parenting role um, with her uh, teen stepson. So Maria um, also would have loved to have joined us, li joined us live, but she has sent me a video. So um, Maria is the mum of two school-aged children, um, a boy nine and a daughter no the son's six and the daughter's nine I think if I've got that right she's a future proofing counselor a business coach and a marketing and and has a marketing and psychology biz so Maria has also shared with us um, just what she's um, finding on the course so let me just share that video with you as well Hi, I'm Maria and I've been uh, in the Nurtured Heart program with Lily and Reiki for the last few weeks and I've found the program very supportive. What I love most about the program is that it brings together um, you, the characteristics and the values that you really want to instill in your children that will support them, not just for now, but for the rest of their lives. So... I can't recommend the program enough. As challenging as parenting is today, we all need tools, regardless of who we are, that can support us to create children that are resilient and can handle the world that they're born into. And that's what I really, really um, love about this program. Thank you so much, Maria. Much appreciated. So, I'm going to leave it there. I could talk about the Nurture Heart approach for so long, but I'm going to leave it there. I feel like that, you know, was a great introduction for you if you don't know much about the Nurture Heart approach. But I would love to just bring in Nathan, who's just going to share for the next 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I felt that, you know, last time we did the masterclass, so many people were intrigued and interested when Nathan talked about pyrrole and methylation. So Nathan, not only as a naturopath, uh, herbalist and nutritionist, has a triple degree, um, has huge um, uh, qualifications, as you can see there on the screen. And um, he has become very interested in this topic because, of course, he's seen, you know, what's happened within our family unit. Um, so both from a practitioner's uh, perspective and as um, a naturopath. So let's just let uh, Nathan come on now and, and share um, what pyrrole and methylation is and how that actually, um, how that actually can impact uh, your children. So I'm going to stop sharing and Nathan's going to share his screen and I'm going to mute and hand over to Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much. Just checking you can hear and see me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm so fortunate, again, to have an amazing family that has been so supportive um, and to have really lived through um, what most families are struggling with um, so I can relate. It's often hard that when you're speaking to someone trying to get some help and they just have no idea what you're talking about because they don't know, they don't understand. Um, and the, the great thing about working in a holistic clinic is I can share different experiences with all the other practitioners I work with, psychologists, uh, medical doctors, 
um, integrated chiropractors, kinesiologists. You know, I really enjoy working at Beyond Good Health because it enables me to see a wide variety of patients and then be able to pass on that knowledge to some of the amazing you know, parents in Lillian's group. So the two areas that I'd like to speak about today uh, is methylation and pyro disorder. And you yourself, um, or you may have seen your children, really uh, have fluctuations. You know, some days they're feeling good, some days they're not feeling good. Um, they're all over the place, up and down. And so why is this? Why does that happen? We have neurotransmitters which direct our moods and emotions and attention spans and anger and, motor and happiness and if we feel joy. Um, and sometimes we can make too many of these and, and feel too manic and all, all over the place. Um, we can't focus, we don't have the attention, you know, people tell us we have ADHD, um, or we're not making enough of them, um, and we just feel low and flat all the time, you know, labelled as depressed. And why do we do this? Why don't we just have an amazing day every single day? Well, sometimes we just don't have the, the balance to do it. Um, our brain is the one that should be balancing this for us, um, and it uses raw ingredients made from all the foods that we eat to manufacture these neurotransmitters. And even though the brain is the one signaling all this, we are making the majority of it in the gut. So that's why it's so important to always have a really healthy gut microbiome. So again, going back to why does this happen? Well, sometimes it can start with the genes. For some that go through stress, much like you know, another one right by the side, right beside them. You can have two children, a friend and your, and your child, or even two siblings go through the same experience, but just come out two complete different ways. And so some people genetically have a, a stronger disposition to um, pick up traumas and really hold on to them, and, and it affects them more long term. Um, there might be imbalances um, in methylation or pyrrole. There can also be oxidative stress blocking the body's ability to manufacture all these neurotransmitters and keep the body calm and collected and happy. Um, or we simply may not be eating the right food, so we're not producing um, enough of the nutrients required to make the neurotransmitters. And the other area is epigenetics. So the environment that influences us can definitely affect the way we feel, think, talk, and act. The, I, I guess epigenetics, we didn't really know too much about them until the last couple of decades, but we now know that the, our thought patterns are derived from our previous experiences. And so if you had a traumatic experience, and you were triggered that day by whatever the event was, your cells held that memory and the neurons pass that message along to produce whatever your body felt like it could in that moment to defend itself and protect itself. And that may have been a particular emotion. It could be fear. It could be aggression. It could be um, feeling resentment. Whatever the emotion is that your body produced was done through influencing the neurotransmitters. And epigenetically, we now know every time you have a similar experience as that first traumatic experience, the first experience, the little um, cells, the dendrites and the neurons are now solidifying their first experience because they've been exposed to the same thing again. Now, the second time this happens, is different from the first. It's actually a stronger reaction. And so the third time something similar happens, whether it be, you know, getting told off or, you know, being told to sit in the corner, being yelled at by a parent, being told you're no good to be quiet. Every time something happens that's similar to the very first traumatic experience, it builds up and builds up. And you yourself may have experienced this, that something small happens as an adult but you just feel like flying off the handle or you see someone else fly off the handle and you think, wow, you overreacted. Next time this happens to you or someone else, just think what just happened to them right there was a trigger, but it was actually compounding every time it happened prior to them in that one moment. 
So their subconscious is dealing with the prior 20 times plus the one that just happened just then. And that's why the body feels so overwhelmed. Especially if you have something called pyral or methylation disorder, because then it makes it even harder to deal with this traumatic experience. So oxidative stress, think of it like when you cut an apple in half and it oxidizes and goes brown. Damage has just occurred to the apple cells. So when we are fighting viruses and we've got toxins, when we're eating foods that we're intolerant to, when we're stressed, this is setting off a cascade of chemicals and reactions in our body that's damaging our cells and depleting our resources and trying to repair it. Now, the less resources we have to repair, the less we can keep up. There are some websites, um, I'm going to pop the link just there, that shows children are born toxic. 287 chemicals detected in umbilical cords. So if your child's born toxic straight away and then accumulates toxins, and this is setting up a, a oxidative state, depleting their resources, if their gut's not perfect, their diet's not really good, then when trauma does come along and they're experiencing for the first time how to deal with this, and they happen to be low in neurotransmitters at that time, that that body was not able to stay in control and, and rectify the situation in a calm and relaxed manner, then this is how later in life, as a teenager and adult, you, you have this um, systematic compounding stress that's followed you all the way through childhood up until teenager and adult years. So pyral disorder is when we are actually making hemoglobin, we make cryptopyrals. And our body can usually handle this bit of cryptopyrals, which is slightly neurotoxic. It's a waste product. We can handle it. We can remove it. And yes, we will lose a little bit of B6 and zinc and manganese along the way. But if we have a lot of um, oxidative stress at the time, this makes dealing with this little bit of pyral disorder a lot harder. Now, if you happen to have a genetic uh, predisposition to producing far more than normal amounts of pyrol, now if you have oxidative stress also at the same time, all of a sudden you have just lost a whole lot of zinc and B6 and manganese that your body desperately needed to help make neurotransmitters to keep you calm and collected. And if this is happening repetitively, when something does come along that's a little bit stressful and the brain is expected to know what to do and how to you know, be calm, it just isn't able to do it. It breaks down. It, it doesn't understand what to do. It doesn't have the raw ingredients to keep itself imbalanced. And a lot of symptoms can cross over with methylation. Methylation is how our, our genes are sending messages to our cells to instruct them what to do. Methylation is like a little bookmark that reminds our body the, how this process is supposed to work and make sure that there's no errors made in doing the process. And like I mentioned at the very start, some of us feel up and down because sometimes our brain makes too many neurotransmitters and sometimes it doesn't make enough. And for those who are making too many and our brain's not slowing down and just reading the information, sorting it out, and then moving on to the next one, we call these overmethylators, which is about 8% of the population. They are very all over the place, very hyperactive, can't sit still very manic, the brain just will not slow down. It's in hyperdrive. Um, and the opposite is undermethylators. Undermethylators is like the information's coming into the brain and no one's even processing it. It's just sitting there building up. Uh, and then that makes you feel irritated and angry and frustrated because you just don't know what to do. Imagine a set of traffic lights and both of them are red. That's an undermethylator. Everyone is just frustrated that no one's moving nothing's happening. So in our diet, we have um, methyl groups like methylfolate and um, B12, methylgabalamin, trimethylglycine. So these methyl groups is what we should be adding into this methylation cycle to move things along. Uh, and for those that are over methylators, they have far too many of these. 
And this is why with some antidepressants, it can make the situation a whole lot worse because the antidepressant is producing more of these neurotransmitters. And if you happen to be an overmethylator, you already have way too many. So these are the times when you react not very well with antidepressants. So in methylation, we have nutrients required to turn, think of it like a watch with cogs, to, to return, um, continue the pathway. Um, essentially, we have homocysteine and we convert that to methionine and that goes to SAMe for our cognition and our attention spans, our learning. We take homocysteine and a different part of the pathway down through glutathione to help reduce the oxidative stress that is damaging our bodies to help our liver uh, and to protect our cells. And there's about 15 genes involved in this process that allow the nutrients to turn one step to the next step. MTHFR is one of those ones that helps us take the folic acid from our foods and convert it to the 5 tetrahydrofolinic acid, the activated version. So we can do that process of converting homocysteine to methionine. If we have a dysfunction in this MTFHR gene, then that gene is not working as well and we're not able to convert folic acid. So if you happen to be having a lot of supplements with a lot of folic acid, now there's a traffic jam. You can't convert it and it's building up and it's blocking that methylation cycle. Again, it's like imagine in a watch the, clo the cogs are moving, all of a sudden one stops. Well, now, now the time's gonna stop or be out of time. So similar to the body, the methylation cycle slows right down um, and you become an undermethylator. So again, there are certain nutrients um, within that pathway that again, if you're deficient in, even with perfect genes, you can still have a problem with methylation. So what can we do about it? Well, we can at least take care that we are popping all the nutrients in our body and we're having enough good sources of quality proteins, whether they be plant-based or grass-fed um, meat. We are having complete amino acids and essential amino acids come into our diet with a lot of good fat. And that's the two primary macronutrients that we really need um, to run healthy methylation. The more antioxidants that you can provide the body will help reduce some of this oxidative stress, which we pretty much live with the rest of our life. That's aging, right? We are always making oxidative stress, but epigenetically you do have some control over your environment. The things you say, the things you listen to, if you're in a negative environment, there's gonna be more epigenetic stress when it comes to oxidative stress. Um, if you're in a nice environment and everyone's kind to each other and supportive um, and they're nurturing, then the epigenetic effect on oxidative stress is actually helping to upregulate some of our protective mechanisms. So the, there's a few tests that we can do to see as of right now, are you balanced when it comes to methylation um, and is your body able to remove the excess cryptopyrroles? So one test for the cryptopyrroles is a urine test. Uh, and then the other one is a blood test. The whole blood histamine will show us if you're currently an over or under or you're methylating just fine. And zinc and copper and seroplasmin is another way to see are we copper toxic because copper is blocking the zinc um, or is the relationship between copper and seroplasmin, which carries the copper around, um, can that give us another confirmation of is under methylation over or under? Fortunately, not all GPs are aware or many are aware of what methylation is, how it works, and um, Medicare does not always bulk bill them, unfortunately, uh, but they can be done privately and um, we can arrange testing, but you can go to QML and check out for yourself. Um, you know, are you nice and balanced? So hopefully that uh, was a quick summary, um, a lot of information, quite complex methylation. Um, so you may have to go over and watch the slides and listen to it again, but hopefully that makes a little bit of sense as to why you're seeing up and downs in yourself for your children and how genetics play a part and some of the areas in your diet that you can now start to look at.
Thank you so much, Nathan. It's always so interesting to hear Nathan, um, even though I've heard this over and over again. Um, thank you, Nathan. So I'll share my screen now, if we can. Um, okay, my on. Okay, so just to bring this home now, once again, we could talk about this for so long um, and we've just really touched on the surface tonight. So please, if you are currently on the Facebook page, please let us know you're here. Um, it is um, one family is going to win the scholarship tonight. So you can either use it for yourself or you can use it to gift to somebody else. So we'll be drawing that in just a few minutes. So please just comment. Um, if you could just comment again now to say I'm here um, and that includes everybody on the call, please, that would be awesome because what wouldn't it be a beautiful gift to be able to give to somebody if you feel it's not something you need right now? So make sure you let us know I'm here. Thank you, Laura. Um, and Di is there and... And Krishla, I think, is still there. So just, just put in an I'm here so I can see you're here um, and I can put your name in the draw. But let me ask you this question. Who here would love to enjoy a happier and healthier home and children? Silly question, right? So if you are sick and tired of the yelling, nagging and threats, <laughs> if you crave a closer, more respectful relationship with your children, if you want to gain cooperation with children rather than um, rather than threats, um, where am I? If you want your children to be both happy and healthy today and growing into their adult years, put your hand up. If you want to enjoy your day-to-day -day interactions with your children, let me know. If you just want your kids to listen and follow simple instructions, or if you want to know that when your kids have had kids, so when you're a grandparent, um, that you will have um, super connected and amazing relationships ongoing. So if you want any of those things, um, then you want to join us in our upcoming Nurtured Heart course, which we'll, we'll be running in January. So you heard from Laura live. Um, you heard how emotional she got and how she said this has literally saved her family's lives. You heard from Sharon and Maria as well. And I could have brought on 10 people to share with you or more. Um, we've got 17 families currently in our current course. So just in conclusion, I just want to really share my why and why I really do this. So when um, I actually launched this book, The Revolting Child, A Blessing in Disguise book, back in 2009, our son was just short of, it was published in May 2009, and in June 2009, he turned 16. So he probably was 16 by the time I did the book launch. So I did this book launch in Brisbane, and um, um, Caleb was actually invited to come along and he was a bit reluctant but he came along he really wanted to support me and, and support the book launch but he was just kind of sitting quietly in the back so Andrew and I had shared with the audience of I think about 250 people for memory and and um, somebody we had a Q&A at the end and somebody put their hand up and actually said can I ask your son a question and he was at the back and he kind of goes oh know and I said well it's up to you and he goes oh okay then so the person actually asked a question that was so profound and I don't know why I hadn't thought of it myself they actually said can you tell us why so firstly we've seen the transition from you know just 10 months prior to now and we we heard the story we can see where you are what was it that took you from where you were just 10 months ago to where we see you standing today and my, eye, my ears were like, you know, really like, I need to hear the answer to this. What a great question. And he, he contemplated just for a few seconds. I could almost see his mind ticking over. And what he said has impacted me from that moment until now, like it really has. He actually said, when I saw the effort that my mum and dad went to to be the best parents they could be, 
I just wanted to be the best son. And for me, <laughs> that just said it all right. I wanted to be the best son. Uh, and that's the law of attraction in action, right? What we were giving energy to, we were getting back and we were getting it back tenfold. And um, you might need to come back to this slide to, to read. So these are just a few of the letters that he's written me over the years. And with Christmas coming up, I thought this was a great one to pop in that he wrote to me Christmas 2012. So that's nine years ago. Wow, time flies. And I've got that framed up there. It's beautiful. So that's my why. And I want to be able to help and impact families like Laura's, like Maria's, like Sharon's who shared tonight and like the many, many, many other people that I share this with. So in conclusion, um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you um, for joining us live tonight. I know it's a tricky time of the year, so I appreciate those of you who have jumped on. Hopefully those, um, all those people who registered and are not on live will catch the replay, or you might share this with your friends and family as well. So um, actually, I'm going to extend my offer. I'm feeling generous tonight. I'm going to extend my offer of a free consultation for anybody who jumps on this call, on this uh, masterclass, and watches it between now and the end of December. And they will qualify for the um, one hour consultation with myself valued at $160. So share, share, share away. Um, I know that when I have a conversation with people, you know, they get to know me and I get to know them. So I'm going to offer that until the end of December, feeling very, very, um, very, very generous with that this evening. So thank you, everybody. Uh, Nathan or Andrew, I don't know if either of you was, are still on and would like to just close this out this evening. If not, I can, but if somebody's there, that would be awesome. Can you see me again? I can, thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much again, uh, because you really have provided such an amazing upbringing and uh, using all of the um, mistakes that you've learned and you know as as parent you really don't have a book to go by right and mm. you do your best um, and it's so inspiring to see that you are giving parents um, all of your knowledge and I can see firsthand how that's helping the patients I referred you um, but I also like to say when it comes to me seeing patients I can link majority of the symptoms back to when they were a child and the influences had throughout their whole life. So this is so much more than just getting kids to cooperate. It's helping them develop the best versions of themselves lifelong. The choices they make when they meet their partner, the friends of influence that they choose, it has so much of a huge impact. Um, it's, it's really hard to put into words. I just see the links. So thank you so much again for being so persistent and passionate, bringing this information to as many people as you can. Thank you so much, Nathan. Really appreciate that. And thank you for sharing this evening. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Maria and Sharon, once again, um, for sharing. Uh, have a good evening. Um, I want to wish everybody an amazing, um, fun-filled, heart-connected um, festive season with your friends and your family. I hope you um, get to enjoy each other's company and um, you really enjoy um, each other. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to catching some of you in our 2022 Nurture Your Heart to Greatness course. Bye for now. <laughs>